Oh boy. Oh yes. Oh no. Oh maybe so. Welcome into Snow the Goalie, which we can confirm is the only Flyers podcast. And uh, boy, oh boy, what a week to miss. Here we are at the end of uh, free agency, if you want to call it that. Uh, We are here to talk about what the Flyers did and did not do. Uh, We've got uh, a controversy. We, We have fans who feel duped. And we have a potential seismic shift in arenas uh, in the city of Philadelphia. We're going to get into all of it today. Uh, First, I want to say hi to uh, the man who is uh, apparently Mr. Glass Half Empty, Chris Terrian Bundy. Find him on Twitter at CTerrian6. How are you doing there? uh, That big smile, that that butte over there. I'm doing good, guys. It's good to be back. I know it's tough at the end of the year to get everybody together. And even tonight was a process, so... Yeah, weeks gone by. Apparently, I'm I'm glass half empty. But I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even see any water in the glass, so it's not a matter of being <laughs> full or empty. I don't <laughs> see any fluid at all in any glass, so I cannot be half or or half full or half empty. But you know what? And, you know it's fine. No, everyone's talking about because it's been talked about all week. But of course, you know. Uh, First of all, I'll say it. Scotty Hartnell has been a friend of mine since I broadcasted here. You know, I've never had uh, – he was a good player for me. He was always accommodating uh, when I was, you know, down uh, – well, between benches or even radio. So, you know, I guess he got frustrated. It was a Saturday afternoon. and But I know – you know what? I'm frustrated too. And, I, yeah, I guess the other thing that gets mired in this too is a few people – and I always see them. They only have like 25 – like not a lot of followers, but they kind of – they come at me in full bore. I love this franchise. And I'm not doing this. It pains me more than anything in the world to have seen what I've seen as a former player that I believe was part of the glory days of the 90s, early 2000s. We had great players. We had good teams. We didn't win. We've talked about this before. Only one team wins. But to have seen what has happened, guys, since um, Ed Snyder's passing and the people that have come in and navigated this ship, it has been one of the worst things I've ever seen. And it tells me, and it pretty much tells everybody else, corporate America should not be involved in hockey decisions. Um, Sports in general, Bundy. Yeah, no, absolutely, Anthony. Sports in general. So, you know, I understand. Listen, Hartnell's on that side of it now. He's carrying water for the team. I did it as well. The problem was is that I saw these things, and and I built a relationship with this fan base a long time ago. And I always Mm -hmm. told the truth when I was on NBC Sports or the radio. I never fluffed anything, not ever. When the team was good, they were good. When I needed to give a little bit more, like say, hey, let's be patient. Let's just wait. Like, it's going to be okay. I think things would calm down, and I believe that. But if I didn't believe it, I wasn't going to try to ever sell it. You know, I was never going to lie to people and say, hey, this is really good, and don't worry, everything's good. I didn't even do that when I was employed by NBC or the Flyers, and maybe that's probably why I don't have a job anymore. But I hold no animosity towards the team or NBC. They make changes all the time. I didn't like getting fired at quarter to five by human resources after 27 years is at service. Um, but that's the corporate America that we're talking about in sports in general. And you know what? I was talking to people at other markets. There's guys just like me too. Someone gets a shiny new toy and they move on from it. Um, I understand Hartnell protecting the team. Um, I just think his timing was, was really bad. And, and uh, you know, I, must have been in a really good mood. I was heading to the Yankees game because I was very tactful, I thought, in my response. I was going to put the picture of Roddy Rowdy up there. Russ, I know you you know this one there. You know where he yeah. used to sit there in the East and said, never throw rocks at a man pocking a machine gun. And uh, that's kind of where I felt a little bit. But you know what? Scotty's a good alumni. He was a good Philadelphia Flyer. And, um, you know, he's getting his way in, in, in the world of broadcasting right now. Um, you may want to just kind of sniff your audience out a little bit more and uh, take the temperature of the room. Yeah, the, the the replies to that tweet, the replies to that tweet did not go the way that I think he anticipated. I, I said it was a Hartnell down, um, but we'll we could get we can come back around to that. But I, I do I think it is important that you know as you as you stated, like from your perspective, this team not being a contender, this team not being run properly, is the you know main source of your angst for the organization at this point, and. You know, somebody else who is impacted by this in a way, didn't play for the team, but has covered the team for two decades at this point, is Anthony Sanfilippo, who unfortunately looks like he's going to have to go down every night and cover another bad team. So, Anthony, how are you feeling uh, after a week and a half without chatting? I want Anthony to have the floor here, but I'm going to tell you one thing right now. You saw a guy that poured his heart into that article last week, Anthony. It was a phenomenal Mm -hmm. read. 
it was heartbreaking. It was a crushing article. But tell us what you were thinking, because I think you really were the spine of the fan base that day in terms of what they heard. Even former employees had called and said, what an article. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, well, I, pre I appreciate that, Bundy. I, and, and yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I know Russ and I were going at it on Twitter because <laughs> Russ said, you know, somebody's going to have to come on this podcast and kind of eat crow. And, and I've, I've never felt that I was sitting here openly, blatantly defending Chuck Fletcher nonstop. I was just one of those guys who was a little bit of a hedger and said, I understand why at this point such and such a thing hasn't happened. But I did, I went back and listened just to make sure that I said this on the air. And I did several times. So I'm going to say it again. I just wanted to make sure that I said, if he doesn't get this right, this off season, then he doesn't deserve a job. Then he doesn't deserve to be the general manager. You know, I'm willing to give him to this off season because of the circumstances as they broke down, combination of a, of a variety of things that were a little bit of bad luck, a little bit of bad timing on their part. Um, yeah, he missed a boat with not replacing Niskanen. Um, there were a couple of misplays on his part, but nothing that was like really a crushing blow as a general manager. You said there and said, oh my God, that was so awful. But when you looked at it, he said, this was the one thing that he could not screw up. Mm -hmm. And there were two paths that he could have taken that this fan base would have accepted. One was the aggressive retool that we kept saying, the words that they used, going after big-name players, bringing those players in. Whether those players would have ultimately resulted in a winning team or not, it would have, it would have at least sparked interest enough to get people back down in the building. You have a brand-new fiery coach. You bring in big-name star players. Maybe that can kind of work together, and you can kind of be a competitive team. I mean, they would have been competitive. They would have been around a playoff, squ playoff spot, right? And so you, you take it from there, and then you keep building the next year, the next year, the next year, as you try and get closer to the Stanley Cup. That was one path. The other path, the one that you know I know Russ really likes, is you tear it down. And, and, and what I mean by tear it down, like not you don't have to go scorched earth 76ers 10 and 72, but at the same time, you can set you can basically send the message out to the fan base that hey, this is going to take a little bit longer, but we need to we need to collect our assets. We need to grow from within, and once, once we start seeing the growth from within, then we'll be more aggressive going after those big-name players, okay? He could have said that. They didn't say it, but if, even if they would have shifted to that just before free agency, maybe at the draft, Chuck comes there during his interview, Chuck could have come out and said, hey, guys, you know, we have a different approach that we're going to take now. We've thought about it. I know it's been six months, um, but we looked at it. The landscape has kind of changed. It's not going to be as easy to move contracts as we thought, so this is the path that we're going to take. If Chuck would have said that, I think the fans would – they would have been upset, right? Like, okay, we're going into a season that's not a good season. But they would have accepted it because they would have accepted the, the, the honesty. They would have appreciated the honesty and transparency of the general manager. Instead, they took a third path. They took a third – the path, not even the less traveled path that Robert Frost talks about. They took the never, never traveled path, the never traveled path. And did something that makes as little sense as anything I've ever seen in sports, where it really it really put on display that there wasn't a plan that was put in place. And you cannot go forth and say, well, we're going to trade assets for Tony D'Angelo, three draft picks for Tony D'Angelo. Not to say that it was necessarily a bad trade, but if you're doing that, that, that suggests you're on one path, right? And then, and then buy out Oscar Lindblom. That's also <coughs> on that path. Okay? So you're on that path. And then turn around and use what resources you have to bring back 35-year-old Justin Braun and sign Nick Delorier for four years with two years no movement for a, the worst fourth-line player in hockey, in all honesty, on your team. And do nothing else. And how about how poorly he left the backup goalie situation, which not enough people are talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carter Hart's going to have to play 70 games this year. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, Felix Sandstrom, uh, he's, he, they didn't even want to bring him back. The only reason they signed him is because Fedotov got sent to military prison in yeah. Russia. It's the only reason they re-signed him. 
We could right? swing by. We could swing by the Arctic, you and me, Anthony, on a fishing yeah. boat and troll them in the back and wheel them in the camp. Exactly. Exactly. And then go out and sign a 32-year-old career AHLer to compete for that spot. I mean, what the hell is this? I'll tell this you what is, it is. This is a, this is pathetic, and that's that's why I was just like, you know what? I, I there's no there is no defending any of it, and the and the reality of it is they could have asked backwards, kind of fallen into a spot that's better than they thought it would be. In all honesty, but this was not the plan to get to go this way. It seriously was not, and uh, you know it, it, maybe they maybe they are going to get better eventually. But at the same time, you can't sell your fans a bill of goods the way that they did. You can't. And you just had to, you had to have come in here and done it the right way. One of two other ways. And the fact that they didn't, they deserved, they deserved the criticism that, that I think that I gave. And when I said that Dave Scott now needs to replace the entire front office, and when I say the entire front office... I don't just mean Chuck Fletcher. I don't just mean Brent Flair. I don't just mean Danny Briere. I mean the entire front office. I mean you take get rid of your money people. Get rid of your analytics people. Get rid of your development people. I don't care if you like some of them. Some of them may have done zero wrong. Some of them might be good employees. It's the, it's the optics of it at this point. You cannot keep these people here... And expect this fan base to buy in to anything you say or anything that you're going to that that, I got, uh, I got that they have. From a, I got a text from a guy that uh, may or may not have done a coaching interview here, and perhaps I asked him how that interview went. He said it was one of the most embarrassing things he's ever seen. I have it on paper. I mean, so this is what we're dealing. So that stuff starts going around the league, reverberating. I mean, and, and you know, if, if, if he's, someone's telling me over text, what are they telling the rest of the league, right? Like, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, again, I was always willing to give the, the, the hockey office, you know, the benefit of the doubt. Um, but very, very frustrating day. And I think the other part, too, of course, that the story of the day is, is the Johnny Gaudreau part, right? Uh, Russ and Anthony. And, and, you know, Anthony, you had a real pulse on this. I know Guy Gaudreau as well. I coached hockey with him for kids our age before as well. There's a whole group of Washington Township people, including Anthony D'Angelo, who's from down there. And I'd actually tweeted that I'd coached a practice with him. I mean, in terms of my experience with him, this is my experience. He was tremendous. A really great guy. Awesome with the kids. Um, so I had a good experience with him. I understand that, and I know there's been situations in the past, but put that to the burner for a sec. The Gaudreau thing is the interesting one because really, Anthony, we know now that he was waiting on the Flyers. Mm-hmm. He was trying to buy them three, four, five hours of extra time to try to get something done. And I read today, and I think it might have been from Spit and Chicklets the other day, uh, that he was talking about the fact that uh, you, you know he had uh, he had the devils in on things. But you could really sense it. He, he said everything but except, yeah, I was waiting on the Flyers. You know, mm-hmm. I was waiting on them. And then the <coughs> deal came around about 5 o'clock, and he jumped on it. But to me, if you have a hometown kid, um, you would have had plenty of time to know about that. Wouldn't you not have in the month before or the six months before when you knew your team was an absolute disgrace at Christmas that you all you needed to shed was to have that vision, the plan that Anthony's talking about, or the no plan that they didn't have, and say, what do we do? Okay, we're not going to rebuild. I was always a catalyst all year of the full rebuild. Mm-hmm. Tear this thing down. Keep the small pieces you need. Send a letter to the fans, and I'm telling you, Philadelphia would have showed up at the building. Nobody over there seems to understand that because it's happened before. You got to put a hard-nosed product in the ice that works their nuts off every single night, and you're going to end up with people coming to the building. Put an effort in, and you'll end up winning games, believe it or not. Torts will provide that. So I'm okay with a rebuild. But to have done all this retool, it's not even a retool. It's what Anthony said. It's a re-nothing. It's adding on players. Like, I think D'Angelo is a nice upgrade. But there's a lot of things that in, that's in, been involved with him. Why wasn't didn't Carolina sign him? Uh, again, people are asking that question. I don't know the answer. But I will tell you this, that I know for absolutely 1,000%, they could have had Anthony D'Angelo last year for $900,000 and not give up a single pick. Mm-hmm. Give up absolutely nothing. And they had that opportunity. And, and do, 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 you, do you know what happened there? I don't, but I, know the, I, I just know the story why, you know, that they could have had him for that price. I, I can tell you right now that with, with pretty much 100% certainty, they wanted to sign D'Angelo last year, and the upper levels of the organization would not let them because they were worried about 
kickback about his about his uh, past. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be as discreet as I could be here with this, okay? But I'm just saying that was a it was a it was not signed off by by the top level of the team. So amazing what a year does. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things. Uh, one on on Tony D'Angelo, as um as Bunny pointed out, coached coached a, a youth camp with him, had a positive experience. Mm-hmm. Tony D'Angelo has a not great past, racial slurs uh, in minors or in junior, um, inexcusable, not good. Um, that that's one thing. M- multiple altercations with teammates in the past, not good. Fight in the tunnel with Georgiev, not good. So that's there, and we can't just say that like everything's hunky dory. You can understand why some people, some fans, uh, even the organization a year ago might have been hesitant to go forward with him. And whether you decide that you want to accept that or not is up to you as a fan. It's not the same. I'm not saying that these are similar uh, infractions or similar whatever. Uh, There were Eagles fans who decided they weren't going to support the team while Mike Vick was the quarterback. And nobody faulted them for it. You could choose to support. You could choose not to. And it's the same thing here. Uh, from the standpoint of, you might think this guy is a reprehensible human being. You don't want him to be on your team. You don't have to support. Now that we've gotten that out of the way. I sat here smiling, and I'm not going to do a long diatribe. But I've been saying for two years that Chuck Fletcher does not have a vision. Chuck Fletcher is a nepotism hire who was hired because his daddy did this job in the league. And he is a less qualified Brian Colangelo because even though Brian Colangelo wasn't a great GM for the Sixers, he did a good job of building a lineup that got them to within a triple bounce from Kawhi Leonard of going on to the next round of the NBA playoffs. Chuck Fletcher is not a guy who builds a Stanley Cup contender. He does not have vision or creativity. He does not have the ability to find players along the fringes. He cannot find value in the margins because he doesn't know where to look for it. He talks about this push towards analytics, and yet some of his own analytics people have advocated on behalf of like Erasmus Ristolainen. I don't know how you find the, the, the grounds for that, but whatever. He hasn't done a good job of bringing in free agents. The one that he did is the one that they've kind of built the team around now, and Kevin Hayes, you bring any friend that he has, there is a rumor that that guy's going to come to Philadelphia. Uh, he gave a contract to Sean Couturier, who now has a back issue. Not great. We hope that Couturier is going to play well, because without it, we're in very bad shape. Um, you've had two years, at least, knowing that Johnny Gaudreau could be interested in coming here. You've known for at least six months that he was going to be interested in coming here. When you fired Elaine Vigneault in December and didn't fire Chuck Fletcher, I said it was a mistake, and I've said it every day since. You kept an incompetent GM in place to oversee the trade of your captain, Claude Giroux. You've kept him in place to oversee a trade deadline. You've kept him to oversee the lead-up to and the actual NHL draft. You've now kept him in place to go through free agency. And when you said a few months ago, if you're Dave Scott or if you're Chuck Fletcher, that you're going to do an aggressive retool, you sold fans on the concept that this was going to be something that would turn around quickly. You hired a coach who is not a project. It is not a development coach. You hired a guy who's brought in here to maximize the assets he has and to put you into contention of some sort, whether it's this year or in the next two years. You made every signal to this fan base that you were going to make every effort to make this team competitive worthwhile and worth money around the time that season ticket holders were going to re-up their tickets. And what you did is you turned around, pulled wool over their eyes, and smacked them in the back of the head. This is an absolute abhorrent thing. And if this were any team in Philadelphia other than the Philadelphia Flyers, the calls for Chuck Fletcher's job would be 24-7 on the Fanatic and on WIP. But because the Flyers have fallen out of relevancy in the way that they have over the last, say, five years, The sports stations are talking about it in as much as they're going to talk about it. The fans are upset. Money has been spent. And people feel duped. And now what you've done is you have somehow figured out a way to unite the analytics community, the Broad Street Bullies community. You've taken people who support Snow the Goalie. 
You've taken people who support Broad Street Hockey. You've taken people who support High and Wide and O and B and whatever Jason Martinez is doing. And you've somehow unified them all into hating what you have done to this team. And you've taken any excitement that could have existed for the season and you have buried it. You, Chuck Fletcher, you've done that. And you, Dave Scott, you've done that by allowing him to stay. And now it's too late. Because if you make that change in the front office now, you look desperate. So I don't know what you do. Well, uh, B- Bundy, should... before you respond, I have one, one, quick, one quick thing. Mm-hmm. I, I just like to point out that Russ started that saying, I don't want to go on a diatribe. And then I did. I know. All right. Go ahead, Bundy. You're up. Well, I, I, you know, I think this is a problem, right, guys? Like, the one thing I hear, and I know you guys do as well, but when I, when I, go, um, when I go around the city or you go around the hockey world, you talk to people. They ask, who is in charge of the Philadelphia Flyers? Like, so that's what I'm saying is you got like Dave Scott who props himself up there and he starts talking about Jerry Mayhew, who no one even knew. I mean, he honestly, guy, when I talk about Uncle Junior Soprano, that's Dave Scott. It's like everyone's telling him that you got the you got the reins of the full mob here, Dave. But really, he doesn't. He thinks he does, but he doesn't. So someone's either pulling the wool over his eyes or he doesn't really understand what's going on in the hockey world. The blank check suggested right off the bat he had no clue what he was talking about. We make light of that. I make light of the blank check everywhere I go because there's really no such thing in a cap world. The closest thing you were going to get to a blank check was clearing $9.7 million in cap space to get Johnny Gaudreau here. That would be the extent of a blank check. I will allow, though, that the blank check could have extended beyond just the the cap implications. That the idea is you were going to offer a blank check when it came to the head coach, to building out analytics, to building out the coaching staff. Like, I will allow for that because that was the big blowback. That was then the company speak was he wasn't just talking about the cap. He's aware that there's a cap. Fine. It's great to splash money at all of these other factors, at all these other parts of the organization. But the guy you have in charge has not been the right guy. And, and so often they've come back to, well, COVID. COVID made things hard. This made it hard. That made it hard. Other teams have moved on from their front office executives. I don't understand how after this much of a, of a struggle, you stuck with him and allowed him to hire a coach. Because, guys, for better or worse, if we were setting the odds – Chuck Fletcher is the GM of this team next year. I'd say it's pretty bad, which means you've now gone out and spent more money on another big name coach who a GM is then going to have to come in and go with. And Tortorella's a great coach, but like you've now maybe limited which GM is going to come in because GMs like to hire their own guy. Anthony, go ahead. The the big, the big problem I have here guys with Chuck and, and it came out with a very, a very innocuous question that I asked um, I didn't even think I was going to have an opportunity to ask, but they called that press conference together so hastily on uh, free agency day. They gave us an hour and nine minute notice um, that Charlie O'Connor was the only uh, media member present for the actual press conference. The rest of us were on Zoom and we, we were told in the email, no questions on Zoom. So we just assumed Charlie was asking every question, which was going to be ridiculous. But And he did a good job. He said he was by himself. He did, he a, did really a good, good job, job insofar as like trying to grill a GM while you're also in the room and hoping yeah. that he's not going to walk out and like have a hissy fit in the hallway. So, right. So I give Charlie a Charlie. lot of credit for that. Yeah. But then they eventually turned it to, to us on the, uh, on the presser, uh, uh, on Zoom. And I, we weren't expected to get much, but got that first question in. And the one question I asked about was valuation, how you value draft picks. Because I wanted him to explain to me – how Tony D'Angelo is worthy of three draft picks, but that you wouldn't give up a, a draft pick, one draft pick, to move out salary to go after a big name player. Okay, and I didn't want to mention any, was the, the writers before me tried to mention Johnny Gaudreau by name, and Chuck dismissed those questions because Johnny Gaudreau is not his property and he can't talk about him, right? So I was saying, okay, let's just be just let's generalize this. It could be any player that you want to go after. How do you value the draft picks? And Chuck, in his response, as he was explaining it, we don't have to get into the details of the explanation, but immediately said, well, I turned to our head of analytics, Ian Anderson, and he put together this valuation chart for the, for the picks, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Chuck Fletcher always has to deflect responsibility to other people. He may not say it out loud all the time, but it's always our group 
we believed. Yeah, it's never me. It's never I. There's no self accountability with Chuck Fletcher, and we know from talking to people behind the scenes that he's he's a guy that needs six or seven people to talk to him about about a decision that he can't make a decision on his own. He he doesn't. Ha- not to say that you have to. Not to say that not checking in with others and getting multiple opinions is a bad thing. I'm not trying to suggest that. It's totally fine. But at some point, when you're in the position or the title of, have the title of general manager, president and general manager even, in his case, you have to be the be-all, end-all. You have to be the hammer. Sometimes you have to make a call that other people in your organization don't want. All right? For better or for worse. You know, we criticize Ron Hextall for taking the wrong guy in the draft uh, when he drafted Nolan Patrick, despite the the, the um, scouts wanting to take McCarr or, or Heiskanen. But the fact of the matter is, at least Hextall made the decision on his own. He made the he said, "I'm a GM. Here's the call I'm making. It's I'm either going to sink or swim with it." Chuck doesn't do that. Chuck always needs to have somebody else kind of involved, kind of attached to the decisions. And I think that that's the thing that bothers me most about how this is playing out. Because it's not – just, just take, take the responsibility. Show leadership skills. Fall on the sword. Even if it was Ian Anderson that told you that and, and it turns out it's a bad deal, right? I don't think it's going to be a bad deal. I think it's actually going to be a pretty solid move for the Flyers. But even – let's just say it, it's, it turns out to be a disaster. And Tony D'Angelo is terrible here or he – you know, something happens and he, they can't keep him. He, they got to get rid of him. Everybody's going to remember, well, Ian Anderson's the guy who came up with the with what you should trade to get not, Tony man. D'Angelo, not and Chuck don't Fletcher. Worry. Don't, don't worry, they're not. Nobody, nobody's going to remember Ian Anderson's name. So, Ian Anderson, if you're listening, you've been on the show before with Ant. They're not coming after you. Ten years down the line when Ian Anderson's like running analytics for another team, nobody's going to be coming after Ian Anderson. Because people are so pissed off about what Chuck Fletcher has done. He, for better or worse, whether he has the balls enough to actually make a call is up for debate. But ultimately, he's the one that has to sign off on it. He's the one that everybody wants to see the, the head lobbed off of, you know, figuratively here, right? So um, at this point, I don't know what this team can do to get fans back. Because I, there, there's part of me that wonders, Dave Scott... Whether we want to go down the route of, like, Dave Scott should be running things or not doesn't matter because he hasn't been removed. Does he understand hockey? No. Does he have a senior – Well, hold on. Does he, does he have a senior advisor who, in theory, is, like, trying to educate him about hockey? Sure. Are there still people who have been in this organization, Paul Holmgren, Dean Lombardi, Bob Clark, who have maybe offered their thoughts in the past to Dave Scott? Perhaps. I'm going to say this, guys, and I know that you're not going to be thrilled with it. But if we're going to send everybody out to pasture, if we're going to clean out the entire front office, all those guys need to be gone too. They have to. They can be related to Flyers alumni. They can work with the Snyder Youth Foundation. They can do all of it. But none of them should have a hand in what happens next. If this organization is going to go out and use an outside entity to try to find the next head coach, then they can certainly go out and try to find a new GM, to find a new president of Hockey Ops. I don't want anybody else involved. I'm an And whether that's popular or not, I don't really care. There are so many parts of this that have gone so poorly that nobody can survive. It just can't happen. It can't. Because if you're going to go into the season with what it looks like you're going to go in with, you've somehow unintentionally tanked. And now it's just a matter of, does Tortorella take a a really bad team, what should be a bottom three team, in the league, and does he now put them into purgatory, that area that I hate so much, that 7-12 to 12 range? It's entirely possible that he can coach a team up. And unfortunately, that ain't going to help things either. You're muted there, fella. Sorry. There you go. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no, no matter what. You know, the thing is with this team, and, and you know it going in, right? I think the one thing people like is to know you have a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like I they have no chance. They cannot win a Stanley cup as created right now. It's not happening. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you they have a chance of winning it. Look at the two teams that made it this year. I mean, Colorado and Tampa, this team is legions away from being anywhere near playing at a competitive seven game series against those clubs. You're right though. I agree. And I've said this from the beginning. I like John Tortorella. I think he's a good guy. I've met him many times. 
He's, uh, he's got humility. He's funny. He's going to ask guys to work hard, to compete. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those things at all. And I think he's going to do a great job. My problem is, is that I don't think they needed him. I don't think they're ready for him because, you know, I would have rather, I would have rather them guys say like, here's torts. We got a young team that's we're rebuilding right now. We're going to try to sprinkle some good pieces in because it is Philly. Yeah. Listen, that's the one thing I, you know, maybe they'll hear this, but this is Philadelphia. Damn it. Like this is a great town and people should want to come here. You know, when I was here, every, this was a destination. Everybody wanted to come here. It's a great area, but the franchise treated players right. That was one thing, right? Like, Snyder went out of his way to treat his players, his management, and most certainly his fans better than anybody. And that was a family part that came about. So Philadelphia was that destination. Uh, and I think John Tortorella is going to be a great Philadelphia coach. The problem is he doesn't have the horses to get himself on the track and actually win a race. That's the reality. This team will, I think, probably play well, Anthony. I, I know, Russ, you probably think the same. Probably first 15 games. They might even have a winning record, but uh, you cannot stay up the, the top of the pack with a lineup like this over the course of time. It is a, just a straight reality. And by Christmas time, you're going to have the same people going back to the well again with the complaints about what this team is. It, that is Philly. It, at yeah. the end. In all honesty, <laughs> yeah. right. in all honesty, the, the, the best path forward for this team is to not have a good start. But maybe take time to come together under Tortorella and to be better second half of the year mm -hmm. kind of start to see it work start to see his system come together find out who who buys in who doesn't buy in that kind of thing really see what guys are and that way if you get off to a bad start maybe they replace the general manager because if they get off to a good start Bundy if they get off to a good start let's just say not even you know just a winning record slightly you know, maybe a couple games over 500 nothing special not like tearing the, putting the world on fire but like you know, you, through your first twenty games, maybe you know you're you're eight, eight, six, and six, no, I mean, that's too few. Uh, uh, ten, eight, and two, right, or something like that. Okay, um, he's still going to be the GM because they're going to show pr improvement, signs of improvement. All right, and that's the, and that's the concern that I have. Like to me, it would be better if they sucked in October and November. Replace him. And then get good under torts. Here's why I'm saying it, and this is actually from experience on this one. When Ken Hitchcock came in, right, after, uh, I guess it was Billy, like every single guy, veterans, Johnny LeClaire, Roenick, like we were like, oh, shit, man. Like we got, we got a real drill sergeant, like a cop coming in here. And I'm telling you right now, like I was really, really focused with having a good start to the season to impress that guy, to give a good impression. Uh, of course, things started off totally outside of hockey, but yeah, I still ended up with Hitch for four years at the end of the day. Uh, but that I'm just telling you guys, when you come in, those veteran guys, you're going to see them doing some extraordinary things to try to make an impression on the coach. That's why I think the early season could be a success. Which ultimately isn't the best thing, right? And like, I, I totally agree with, with Ann's thought of like, you want to see them do better in the second half. I think the, the, the perfect scenario here, is that uh, a couple of the guys who have been uh, held up with nagging injuries are held out of the lineup to – they're not rushed back. So, like, Joel Farabee maybe doesn't come back till Christmas instead of maybe Thanksgiving. You it'll, see, it'll, be, it'll be November. He'll be back in November. But I'm just saying, like, conceptually, just hold them out. There's no reason to rush back because if you have that bad start, then it doesn't look like you're trying to play yourself into a playoff spot. Ryan Ellis – not going to play this year, perhaps. All right, cool. LTIR it is. Kevin Hayes has had a bunch of surgeries in the last 18 months. Are we going to rely on him to be healthy? I don't know. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. Will every Philadelphia, will every phantom uh, end up injured like they have in the last year? Who knows? Maybe. Maybe not. I guess the, the best scenario here is that you see the system going into place and you see the work ethic and the culture in the second half, that is very clearly Tortorella, but the results still aren't there. That's the perfect scenario. I want to ask you guys this, though, because the, the team that seems to be doing what the Flyers should have done is a team that's won multiple Stanley Cups, and that's Chicago. Chicago doesn't exactly have a town that likes to watch a loser. 
They're used to seeing a team that contends year in and year out. Again, that has won multiple cups in the last decade. If Chicago, of all teams, is willing to tear it down and to be very open about the fact that they're in asset collection mode because they know that the best path forward for them is to collect assets and build a team for the future, why was it so hard for Philadelphia to wrap its head, this organization to wrap its head around the idea of doing a similar thing? Is there an explanation? And I'll go to you because you, you for a long time have said, don't, don't overreact. You have to see what's next. Don't overreact to no Debrinka trade. You have to see what's next. So what's, what's the rationale? <clears throat> so Chicago is, is gambling. Let's be honest, guys. They're gambling. They're gambling that they're going to finish with the worst record. They're gambling that they're uh, going to do well enough in the lottery to not fall outside of the top two. Um, because those are, the, those are your generational talents in this draft. Um, and that because and with that, they can then start rebuilding around a young star like they did when they drafted Patrick Kane in 2007 and were able to win a Stanley Cup within three years. Right? I mean, but you have to hit on that. You have to hit on that. If you don't hit that, let's just say Chicago, get, you know, they, they have a bad season, whether they're the worst team or second worst team, whatever. But let's say the lottery doesn't go their way and they fall to like four, four or five in the draft. Is it a success then to do what they did? I, I mean, that's the, that's the main question. So it's, it's, a, it's a real it's – a, it's a gamble. It's a gamble that yeah. they feel like that this is worth taking because they're in a situation where their best players are way too old with long contracts that are hard to move. Um, and so they moved on from their good young players who – it probably they probably would be on starting on to be on the downside when they're good again, but they really took it. They, they gambled, and this is what they're doing, and and maybe it works out for them. Maybe it does, but maybe thing, maybe it doesn't. Another thing too, just with it, guys, was the fact like when you've won three Stanley Cups like that, you have the luxury of being able to tell your fan base to chill because we've done it before. You had three parades in Chicago yeah. in the last twelve years, right? So you have that luxury to be able to say to your fan base. Settle down. We, we're going to take. We're going to try to treat you guys good again. We're going to try to get back to those parades. But but you're right. You know, I mean, you're you're, you're gambling on trying to get one of those lottery picks. Yeah, and I, was, I think we're the first. Well, the I was going to. Right, Anthony. Yeah. Well, I was going to mention Colorado, right? So Colorado went through this twice, Russ. All right. So they, yep. if you go, go back, you know, they they were the worst team in hockey in 2010. They drafted Landis Gog in 2011. They didn't have a first round pick in 12, but then they draft McKinnon first overall in 13. Okay, and then they start to get a little bit better, and and then in fourteen, and then they fell back again, and they said, "Oh, well, we got to rebuild again." Here we go. Twenty fifteen, they stink. They draft Ranton in first overall, right? Or uh, uh, in the first round, tenth overall. Uh, then they get uh, the next year, they took Yost tenth uh, overall, and then Makar in seventeen. You know, so like, and then that, that's three years to seventeen. Then it's like eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two. You see how long it can take. And that's with a team that hit. They but hit on guys. Fruit. But, like, in fairness, though, it, it did bear fruit. Okay, and- but, Russ, but you, you, it bore fruit. But it bore fruit 12 years down the line. I, I don't necessarily think there is any manager in any sport who is looking at their team saying, yeah, let me, let me build for 12 years from now. Like, nobody's thinking that far down the line. But the thing nobody's is, like, the, last, the last four or so years that you mentioned there, Colorado was a good team. They could sell their fan base on the idea of who didn't get past the second round. Yeah, but they were still this year. But they were still a good team, and they still had pieces that people would consider elite pieces. Like even if you go back to the Flyers teams of the Giroux era, there weren't that many times that you would look at it and say we have truly elite players. It was Claude Giroux. It was whatever you thought of Jake Voracek. It was whatever you thought of Wayne Simmons, uh, and and a few defensemen from time to time. But like, I guess my argument here would just be, you know, you mentioned. It is a gamble that Chicago's doing because they're trying to get into that top two of the draft, right? But they at least committed to trying to make that work. What Chuck Fletcher has doomed this team to is likely somewhere between, I don't know, at best the sixth pick and at worst like the twelfth pick. And in a good it draft in, and like and like and a good draft in twenty three, 
Like maybe that ends up being good. Like maybe whoever gets drafted at number eight or something ends up being better than one of the you know uh, the fourth or fifth pick. But I'll, I'll give you one. I'll give you one, Russ. Go ahead. I'll give you one that kind of makes a little bit more makes your argument that I think no one's talking about. Okay. Um, look look at what how Ottawa is kind of doing things right now. Sure. Okay. And I'm not saying this just because this is where Drew ended up. It could have been anybody that goes there. Drew's not even the main part of this. The point is, is that they w- what year was it that they reached the conference final? 17, right, when they lost to Pittsburgh in the, in the Eastern Conference final? It really made that push. Okay. Then the next year, they were terrible. And they were like, okay, well, they drafted Brady Kachuk. Mm-hmm. Then in 19, they thought, okay, well, we can bounce back because 17, we made the conference final. They still didn't have a great year. And then that's when we're like, okay, we got we to gotta go into rebuild mode. And they traded, uh, what's his name, to San Jose, the defenseman? Um, Carlson. Carlson, Eric Carlson. Eric Carlson. Okay. And they ended up with three first-round picks in 20. And they drafted Tim Stutzla, who's looking like he's like a legit player. Jake Sanderson, who has uh, – he's coming. I mean, he was U.S. Uh, national team uh, defenseman. They drafted him fifth overall. And Ridley Gregg, Mark Gregg's kid, um, flyer scout. Uh, three first-round picks. Then they went and drafted Bush's son. Uh, in 21, right? And so like they're they're building these young players that are coming, okay? And then they go and trade for Debrinket. Now they're being linked to possibly being a team that could be in on Matthew Kachuk, who wants to play with his brother. So now all of a sudden, if you're Ottawa with all those good young players coming, and then you, you already have Brady Kachuk, and you're able to bring in Debrinket, Giroux, and maybe possibly trade for Matthew Kachuk, that's kind of the, the way you expedite a rebuild. In that, in that frame of, of mind, I'm okay with it. But you didn't have – you have to still hit on those picks. It looks like they hit definitely on one. Sanderson's coming. I mean, he's – you know, defensemen take – obviously, you know, Bunny knows this. They take a little bit longer than the forwards um, to, to get it to the NHL. And, and then, look, if, if Ridley Gregg and, 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 and Boucher end up being what they think they're going to be and, and, the, and you get both Kachucks, that team's going to play hard. And yeah. they're going to play yeah. physical, and they're going to be tough to play against. And that's a team that I look at and say, I'd get behind a team like that. I could sure. get behind that. But the Flyers did here. The fans did here when we were told that was Konechny and Provorov and Patrick. We were told the same thing. Yeah. So the guys, the five or six you guys you rang off, like I've seen every one of those guys, a little piece. I can't, I'm not certain that they're all going to be stars. Right. A lot of them are just end up being role guys, even at that rate, Anthony. You know, so I'm saying is that. We, we were told the same thing in 2015 as those younger guys came up. Hey, the kids are here. The kids are here. It's the same thing. You know what? The kids got to deliver or you're going to be in the situation with, that happens here. That's why I think winning, the more you look at it, you have a good manager. Like, look what Eiserman did in Tampa. Even Joe Sackett really slow walked the process. And I'll tell you what, he took a lot of beating around the league. Yeah. You remember people said he was a lazy GM. Mm-hmm. He didn't do the work. Um, no. No. But one thing he had the luxury of was having those high picks, right? Like you add McCarr and McKinnon to a team, you're going to be great for a decade or more. That's just that. Those are that's right. the way it is. It's like Kane and Taves and Duncan Keith. You're going to be good no matter what happens. So I think that that's the problem that you you look at with Ottawa. Like I mean, yeah, I like those guys you mentioned, but again, until they get in the league and they build their rhythm, Brady Kachuk's a star. We know that Matthew had certainly been there already. Um, but there's still guys you just never know, and I think that's part of the problem, the, the, the frustration of the fans here, Anthony, as well, is that they were told and they were sold that hey, this is going to be a team that's going to give us a chance to win a Stanley Cup, and you know what? Those players are still here, and none of them are delivering that to that level that we expected. And as we move on here, like the, I think ultimately the thing that has so many people frustrated, and as I mentioned before, it's people who don't typically agree on this stuff. It just feels like you kick the can down the road another year because it just feels like. Regardless, we're going to be sitting around at this time, December, looking at a team that has the same kind of outlook as last December. And if they don't make a change in the front office, we'll probably be in the same place a year from now as we are right now. It, it is just frustrating. And the sad thing is, you know, whether you believe a rebuild can work or not, at least there's the promise of what could come. There's a reason to go down to the arena in that like, hey, some of these kids that we've heard about, like say Zade Wisdom comes up. Say you see more of, of Wade Allison or Lasinski or who, whoever you want, right? Then you say, all right, let's go see the kids play. Now, tickets are still going to be really expensive. Maybe you get a deal on the secondary market. Maybe the organization finally comes around to the idea that, like, 
people don't want to pay high prices to see a bad product and they slash some prices. Maybe they don't, maybe they do. But you can at least sell people on that. Like, let's not forget, it's not like the Sixers led the, the league in attendance during the process. But there were still fans who would go down because it was an affordable game to go to. It was a good family atmosphere. And people went down and they watched Xander Blue play for the Philadelphia 76ers. And if you've never heard of him before, you're welcome. Casper Ware, they went and watched. But at the same time, you can't look at this and say, hey, there's an easy way next year to turn around and say, this team's got it. This team can make a, a free agent move and a trade next year and then be a contender in a year. We're looking at at least two years away again, even if you believe in that path. Fucking Anthony got a friggin' invite to the camp was the other day as well. <laughs> you didn't hear me. Things are so rough, Anthony got an invite to camp. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they need a big left defenseman. <laughs> They, there you go. they want they wanted some more size. That's what they wanted. That's, they wanted more that's size. That's exactly right. Hey, so you guys had mentioned uh, Matthew Kachuk, and uh, yeah. it stands to reason that Chuck Fletcher is going to at least make it look like the Flyers are in on it because he can't have any worse pub than he's had so far. Um, it's sad for Calgary because boy, did they they looked like a team that was on the up and up. They looked like an exciting team. Gaudreau bails to go play in Ohio, and. Uh, Matthew Kachuk says he's not going to stay. He has no intention of re-signing when his contract's up. Uh, is there a path to the Flyers going after Matthew Kachuk? And even if they did, is there any reason to believe that he would re-sign here? And by the way, is, what, what the hell does a package look like for Matthew Kachuk if you've traded all these picks for Ristolainen and D'Angelo and, and such? Like, what does that look like, Ant? Do you... Do you move a 2023 first round pick to get off of JVR to, to get Kachuk? Like, no, I think, like? I think, I think, I think, what, like? I, I think that, again, this is, I, this is a long, long, long shot. I don't think that they're going to be anywhere near the final conversation for Matthew Kachuk. But I do think it's, you know, obviously if, you, you know, you, you do your due diligence, you kick, you know, you kick the tires, as they always say. And if you make an offer, the offer that you try to make them, you try to give them players that you know that they are interested in. Um, and and try and sweeten it a little bit. Um, and I think that the offer probably would be something along the lines of uh, Travis Konechny, um, Travis Sanheim, who played there. Uh, he played in Calgary uh, in junior hockey, uh, and the Florida pick in 24. That doesn't so you that's that, two NHL caliber players plus a future first round pick. And I think that's a fair trade for Kachuk. Um, it's not going to be enough to get him. I, it, so it doesn't really make a difference. Somebody will make a better offer. Yeah, I, and, and sure. I don't think I, I don't, I don't think, think that's I don't think that's near. I don't think enough. Chuck can do better than that. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I don't know. I mean, you you would have to like start depleting your system to beat yeah, that yeah. offer, and I, I don't necessarily know if that's worth it. I, this is a subject for a whole probably episode, guys, that we should do. But you made a good point, Russ, talking about Calgary. Um, again, you know, like there's teams like Ottawa, like I know they did a good, good off season, but the, the NHL has really got to start looking into this because I, I, one of the issues players are having, and it's going to happen when Matthew's contract is up in Toronto, I'm telling you the, 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 the travel right now is a, is a major problem for guys and re-signing, uh, driving to the airport park and going through the terminal every time for the Canadian teams. People say, Oh, you know, we're going to say, stop being so selfish. And no, it's a problem. And because if a guy can go to Columbus and go jump on a flight a lot easier, making a lot more money, He's going to do it than taking the same offer in Canada. I'm from I'm from Ottawa, born and raised. I love the city, um, but I wouldn't play here for that reason. If I were a player, I mean that the way it's gone back and forth. Now, you're, unless I was you're saying the you're career. saying the way that like the, the the travel protocol because of COVID is what you're saying, and like the the crossing. No, even, even prior, prior to that, like if you play in Canada, you're getting you're you're paying taxes, even though you get paid in, in American. You're paying the Canadian taxes. You're going through every single terminal on every single trip until you get to the United States. Uh, when you've got to cross over, got it's, it. It, it is an inconvenience for guys, and I'm hearing more and more about it. And then add uh, the fact that guys have more entitlement than they did back in you know 1980 or 1990, where they're still flying on charter flights, just hoping to get the smoking section at the back. Uh, that's what they're dealing with, and 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 here they are. But you know, it's, it it is an issue, and, and I'm telling you, it's going to detract from Canadian teams. It's going to be a while unless the Toronto Maple Leafs do it. I think it's going to be a really, really long time unless or Edmonton guys may want to go there, but it's going to be hard for a Canadian team to win multiple cups or be good and relevant for a long, extended period of time to do what Chicago did or what Tampa Bay has done. All right, so uh, people should not go out and buy their uh, Matthew Kachuk jerseys. Okay, got it. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna scratch that <laughs> gonna scratch that off no. the list. 
off the list. Um, hey, so I know that we touched on this. Um, we can talk about one of... I don't, it's not even worth it. Nick Delorier. Poor, poor Delorier. You know, let's all be honest. We know why Delorier got signed. You guys know why, right? And you're smiling. Why, Russell? You know why. You know why. Oh, wait, Chuck, but, Chuck was familiar with him, right? Chuck was familiar with him because he played for... Minnesota. All right, good. Minnesota. That's that creativity that good old Chucky brings to the table. Chuckles, as uh, some have taken it. Although he, did, he did not play for Chuck. No, but he played for Minnesota. Yeah, so but it not counts. for Chuck. It's playoff it counts. experience, guys. What's that? Does he have a lot of I don't, playoff I don't ask, experience? He has barely any I mean, NHL experience. Minimal. He, he has minimal NHL experience in a meaningful way. Um, well, I've seen him around. I remember him in Buffalo like seven years ago. I think I remember him wheeling around the ice out there. Yeah, and, uh, but I don't know. You know, I don't know. He wasn't making the playoffs in Buffalo any time. He played. Time. He played. He's played five playoff games uh, last year with the Wild. They were the first five playoff games he ever played. I don't want to. He was with make Buffalo, it, I, Montreal, Anaheim. Never made the playoffs with any of those teams. I don't want to insult the guy. He's pursuing his dream. He's playing in the NHL. A team gave him a contract. The contract is ridiculous. Good for him. I don't fault yeah. the player. Okay? 20 team no movement clause for two years, though, huh? Chuck was really sweating that one. All right. Let's get to the thing that actually could have massive ramifications for the organization. And I mean, like, long after Chuck Fletcher is gone. So if the news breaks on Thursday morning that the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, led by Josh Harris and David Blitzer, are uh, they have a proposal for a new arena. Now, this might sound familiar to those of you who are listening who hate basketball and the Sixers and don't care, but you should if you care about the Flyers uh, for this reason. The arena proposal that they have to be in Center City is at a great spot, at least if you're a fan of public transit. You've got SEPTA, you've got Regional Rail, you have PATCO. Uh, much more accessible from a public transit perspective than the sports complex. But the big issue is the Sixers bring in quite a bit of buzz, revenue, and attention. They're arguably the most valuable non-Comcast Spectacor-owned entity that plays or does any kind of a concert or, or an entertainment thing at the Wells Fargo Center. And while we cannot predict where teams are going to be in 2031 when the lease is up between the Sixers and Wells Fargo Center, one would have to assume that if the Sixers were to leave and if they were to be a somewhat competent NBA team at that point uh, nine years from now that this would be really bad and it could be a bad thing for Spectacor and it could ultimately be a bad thing in some way for what they've been working to do with Wells Fargo Center and, and building it up for the Flyers and to try to woo the Sixers into staying now Anthony I know that you and I are not necessarily of the same mind on this arena proposal but if the Sixers were to leave how bad could it be for Comcast Spectacor? Well, it wouldn't be great. I mean, all of a sudden you have have to fill, you know, another 50 dates a year. And you assume the, four, you know, 41 home games and then preseason. a couple of preseason post games season. and then postseason if you if they're good enough to go to the playoffs. Um, so that, that that's automatically, I mean, when you think about the revenue that comes into a game when there's a sold out game, right now it's it's about a little over a million bucks a night. Um, in revenue. So that's, you know, while Wells Fargo doesn't get all of that, um, they get a good chunk of it based on rent and then, you know, the, the, the you know, uh, Aramark and everything else that goes, that's going on in there. So that's a big loss for them in that regard. Um, but what I think is an even bigger loss is the fact that they have really concentrated this whole redesign of the Wells Fargo Center on doing it for the Philadelphia 76er fan. They may be putting it on the shoulders of the Flyers season ticket holders um, with, with the, the increases in, that they've had um, in, in, in certain spots. Uh, but don't be, don't be fooled. This is being done for the basketball fan because these amenities matter to the NBA folk that don't matter at all to the hockey folk. Like I, I was telling somebody earlier today, I said, hockey fans would watch, if the game was good, they would watch it in my bathroom. Right? I mean, like they, they don't care what the surroundings are. Right? They, they just want to watch a good hockey game. Um, yeah. th there's something about the NBA, the experience and everything else that it's got to have all of that 
you know. All the uh, stuff you hate. All the fun. Yeah. All the glitz and glam. It's not that it's the fun. Present- it's not, there's it's, nothing it's, fun know, about know, it. I'm, it's I'm distracting. Messing I'm messing with you. It's completely it's the, distracting. It's anyway. the presentation elements. It's the, it's the screen. Yes. It's the sound system. It's the, the lower walk that they're doing, right? The opening. Yeah. So that there's like the, the catwalk in the mid-level or whatever. Continue, sorry. Yeah, they're, they're doing all, the, all these changes. If they were doing all of this and the Sixers bail, boy, is that a, is that a big loss for Comcast Spectre Core. Now, I'm not convinced that this is a definite thing. I, I think that this is timed nicely by the Sixers to try, and this is, you know, we're nine years out. Sometimes it takes that long to start these the planning for this and everything else. You know, they, I think that they're looking for it as leverage against Comcast Spectacore. And ultimately, if I was a, a, a betting person, I would think that, they're going to stay where they're at. I really do. Um, because let's talk logistics for just a second. They want to build this new arena uh, at, what, 10th and Market, 9th and Market, whatever it is, where the old gallery used to be. Mm-hmm. Let's imagine we have a Wednesday night game, Sixers Wednesday night home game. What's traffic like now? In Center City, Philadelphia, at five o'clock, six o'clock, as people try to go home, it sucks. It's bad. Right on race. Yeah. <laughs> Arch race slot area. Yeah. Oh so that's number one. Now, add in all the people trying to get into the stadium. Okay, where there's not a lot of parking, they're going to have to build parking garages because you're not going to have lots like you have in mm-hmm. South Philly. Like the big open spaces. You're going to have garages, so you're going to have a bunch of people going in and up and up and up and up and up. Parking is going to be a nightmare. Traffic's going to be a nightmare. Okay? It's not going to be an, an easy thing to do. There's a reason the Phillies didn't go there when they built their stadium. There's a reason the Eagles didn't go there when they built their stadium. Um, there's a reason when they built Wells Fargo that it wasn't there. Even though it was, they, these spaces were looked at previously. So, to me, I think this is the Sixers posturing a little bit. And if it falls apart and, you know, they they and Comcast ultimately decide to part ways, well, then at least they have a plan in place. But let's be realistic. Their first choice when they did this before was not there, was it? It was Camden. The second choice was the Navy Yard. They, They had other places that they wanted to go instead that made yep. a lot more sense. They got as far as the logistics two, year, two years ago for Penn's Landing, right? Like that was that was one. Yeah. Of them. The reason that right. I think, and and we went into this over on Crossing Broadcast today. There's a shameless plug for another show on the network. We we dove into this a little bit because if you read even like the Inquirer's breakdown of it, they have labor unions quoted as saying that there are going to be 700 jobs that they believe will be construction and, and other you know like Votech kind of hands on blue collar jobs they're reaching out to local high schools and and such to try to like start a a stream there you've got um adelman the the urban well he's urban planning and and like development and everything so he and he has ties to the city he understands the city you have uh labor unions talking about it you've got i forget the guy's name who's been working on you know the affordable housing uh who you know is very well aware of what gentrification can do who's been you know says is an advocate of of Chinatown and and making sure that people don't get forced out of their homes you have all these different forces in hand and for once it it kind of feels like this proposal has legs that maybe some of the other ones didn't and i'm not saying that i want this to happen i'm just saying that like i i feel like this one has a little bit more to it and i will also note that while public transit right now sucks and public transit has uh, a lot that they need to fix between now and nine years from now, there is a continued and a renewed push from some of the communities around Philadelphia in the suburbs to extend regional rail and to make public uh, transit more um, accessible. It's happening in King of Prussia. It's happening through Valley Forge. It's happening through Phoenixville, through Royers Fort, and up through Pottstown. You get that far, then you start talking about into Reading as well. If you're going to, over the next decade, presumably try to continue to build up on the public infrastructure and, and public transit, the, the spot they're talking about would be a great place if you can fix public transit. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. 
and it doesn't impact the Flyers right now. What we do know is we'll be here every week to talk about it from now until the season starts. We're working on some other fun things, too, and that's worth noting for fans who uh, maybe have wanted to come out and have a, have a chat with us in person. Uh, I'll just say that we have a, a few irons in the fire there, and if you're listening right now and if, if you own a business, if you own a, a bar, a restaurant, uh, a car dealership, anything, and you want to get in on this train while there's still some space, feel free to reach out to us, snowthegoalie at gmail.com. You can reach out to Bundy or to Ant or to myself on Twitter. All of our handles and our, those appropriate links are in the description of this episode. You can reach out to the Facebook page, Snow the Goalie. Um, feel free to reach out because once the space fills up, that's going to be it. I'm very excited about some of the stuff that we've got uh, planned. And I do think that this year uh, we finally feel like it's going to be easier to get people out and together. And I, even if the team's bad, we're going to kind of take this very wonderful, ever-growing Snow the Goalie family and listenership that we've built over time. And I think it's time to, time to have some fun together, guys. I agree. I agree, Russ. And I know we, I know we got to wrap this here. Our buddy's got to run. I got to run. Do you want to hit those last uh, couple of five stars we got? Oh, Ant, did you have them pulled up, or am I supposed to pull them up? I can pull them up. Come on, Russ, this, this is you read them. I, well, you know what? Ant, I, mean, I read I, them. But I read them offline because it makes me happy. I think there was one but, that actually that made me cackle uh, the other day, and I'm having a hard time pulling them up. My computer decided that it's going to have a meltdown here, Ant. You might have to read it. Okay. I'll oh, no, read. here we go. All right, there he goes. I'm sorry. It, it just loaded. This is good podcast. You know, Ant, you could always text me during the show if you're going to do this. You can always drop it in the, the private chat here. Why would we do this? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> My God. Bundy, I, like, you know, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here and you can be uh, you, you, you can, you can be, be back you can be the summer end of school year. You'll find out, Russ, when you have your ninth kid. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Don't curse me. Stop. <laughs> I don't want to hate Jesus, you. Russ. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> threaten you. All right. So uh, <laughs> nine. Um, I think this one we haven't read yet. Uh, Mark Ferrante, I, and I don't know if that's the one you're referring to. Best I, Flyers. I think. Pop- I think. I, I actually think doesn't it go back to the one before before that. From oh no, July you're right. 1st? No, that's no, the first no, one. Th- okay. Best yeah, Flyers yeah. Pod. Five stars. They always tell it like it is. I love how Russ and Ant are basically an old married couple at this point. Bundy has been a great addition too. That's nice. Uh, Good job, also, Mark. Thanks. We had one of our, our typical Lee C. Big thank you to Lee C. for writing a new review. Always five stars. Bless you, Lee C. Bless you. Um, we have one from Danny Fortuna, five stars. Uh, now, look, I said I'm not going to war anymore. I'm being a nice person. I'm not trying to cause conflict, but we do read all the five star reviews, and this one's critical of another podcast, and I'm sorry in advance if it upsets anybody. Couldn't stand Broad Street Hockey anymore. Was looking for a new Flyers podcast after listening to Broad Street Hockey Radio for four years. Came across this one. Great show. Look forward to hearing Bundy on the show. Thank you for finding us. I think that's a big thing. Uh, And I told you the other day, don't say it on the air, just how many unique listeners we've had over the last few months. It's mind-blowing. It's it's pretty wild. This show, Bundy, I got to think. I got to think your beautiful, glowing face on this program has, uh, has helped that in a big way as well. But what a time we've had. I, you know what, guys? You guys built this. Uh, you know, when I, when I left, I, I felt like the year that I wasn't doing anything, I, I was discommunicating with, with the people that I, like I said, I built a relationship with the hockey fans. So this has been a great platform. I want to talk about great hockey again. I want to talk about glory days in this town. Like, that's the thing people need to understand. I want the team to do well. Mm-hmm. But I've seen such a clown show from top to bottom that I'm going to sit here and I'm going to point it out until I get too long-winded with it because I owe the fans of this town. Like, this city means everything to me. The Mm -hmm. sports are the fabric I do. I'm an Eagles season ticket holder. I've bought in on all of it. Even the Phillies are my second favorite team now. We all know. It's an old story, so someone can crack me for that one. But, like, I love it. It's a National League team. They're your let's, NL team. kids are born and raised let's, here. I've let's not, this let's not talk about your AL team. We don't need to we don't I need went to over lose. there in the game. Yeah. I like big deal. Since I was a little kid, so okay. you can't do anything about it. But, okay. but that's why I'm – and I'm telling you, and Anthony, you guys know that. We want this team to be successful. But we need but, – but a lot of it, and I think the fan base too, needs a return to glory. And whatever the hell that was, you know, you hear, you hear a lot of them because you've been around a lot as long as I have where they say, you know, I kind of miss that old school – old school approach to the game in every facet. And I don't think it's more missed than it is here in Philadelphia. Uh, We were treated really well for a long time. And as long as the group is here, that's trying to run it, 
I'm going to be willing to hopefully see things change, but it's been a really, really rough few years, guys. Go fly. Yeah, it has. <laughs> Go fly. Seriously, I mean, go Flyers. Go That's a great way to finish it. That is a good way to finish it. Go Flyers. It sounds like a sounds like a couple tweets that were sent at you, Bundy. Go Flyers. Guys, do we have do we have a way to uh like put a little emoji in the uh the name of the episode? <laughs> like happy little flags <laughs> waving go Flyers. Um go Flyers. Right. We we'll be listen, we'll <laughs> there you go. We'll, <laughs> We'll be back next week. Uh, don't forget now, if you're wondering why we're laughing, you can go over and watch uh, the show over on YouTube, youtube.com slash Crossing Broad. Uh, there's a, an entire playlist for Snow the Goalie, for episodes, for past interviews. Um, very much worth your time to go back and check out. If you're listening and if you're a podcast lover and you're not as big into video, that's fine too. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, uh, pretty much any third-party uh, app that has podcasts. I do want you to do this, though. And I heard this on another show, uh, not Flyers related. And I have to say, uh, I love this idea. Well, what I want you to do, what Ant wants you to do, what Bunny wants you to do, tell two people that are Flyers fans about this show. Just tell two. Don't go overboard. If you have 20, do two over the next 10 weeks. Tell two people about the show. Have them listen. Give it a shot. If they like it, cool. If they don't, that's fine. Harass them until they listen to another one in a couple weeks. But tell, the, tell two people about the show and then come back to us and tell us that you made new fans. By the way, I don't think I said this on the show. A couple weeks ago, my mother-in-law had a, a new like, refrigerator door get delivered to their house. The, the new refrigerator got delivered with a dented door. The guy was wearing a Flyers hat. My mother-in-law goes, oh, you're, you're a Flyers fan. And she goes, uh, do you listen to any podcasts? And the guy goes, hey, I listen to Snow the Goalie. Snow the Goalie is a, that's, that's one I listen to. Made my heart, made my heart warm. It warmed the, the dark cockles of my heart. So to that delivery guy, thank you. You're appreciated. <laughs> and to all of you who listened and all of you who watched, we appreciate you as well. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And let's hope the Flyers do something good. And if they don't, we'll find something happy to talk about anyway. Thanks for listening to Snow the Goalie, the only Flyers podcast. See you next week.